So I, I was asked by Catherine to talk about, with, with this title, about um, treatment successes and, and shortcomings in hydrocephalus. It, a big topic, obviously, so I thought I would um, uh, hone it down and try to give you an update on a couple of research studies that, that focus on um, two uh, problems in hydrocephalus management. So one is uh, shunt failure, and the other is the long-term outcome of infants that we treat with hydrocephalus. And what we'll talk about with each of these is a specific um, uh, problem and a specific way of answering that problem or trying to answer that problem. So with regards to shunt failure, we'll talk about a specific uh, operative technique and how it may or may not uh, help the issue of shunt failure. And then with regards to long-term outcome of infants with hydrocephalus, we'll talk about the, one of the big questions we have in, in hydrocephalus treatment is whether the choice of endoscopy versus shunt uh, makes a difference in the long term. And we'll start with shunt failure. And um, the, uh, the approach I'm going to take here, I'm, I'm going to show you the, the type of uh, talk that I, I give in front of a medical audience for the most part. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'm not simplifying it all that much for you. And part of that is um, uh, I, I think I want you to see how we communicate in, in the medical field. And, and Mark had already talked about that, about looking at resources. Where, where we look at resources. When you're on the internet, there are the, the, the same resources that are available to us are, are what you can find. Um, and I think there, there's some benefit for you to be a, a, a more sophisticated user of, of this type of literature that's out there. And the, the bigger part of this is even if you don't, um, if you miss some of the slides and, and some of the statistics and that that I'm going to talk about, the, the bigger lessons to learn from this particular topic here is to get a sense of how we as, as researchers develop ideas, how we go about first investigating new ideas, and how we go about then moving that idea forward and deciding whether this is um, something that is of actual benefit to um, our patient population or not. So this is um, an interesting um, question that we started with, and it, it's something very simple. And the, the question is, is shunt survival, and we're not talking about life or death survival, what we're talking about here with shunt survival is whether it fails or not, whether it needs uh, surgery or not. Is shunt failure affected by the choice of anterior versus posterior entry site? So this is a, a seemingly trivial point for us in neurosurgery. It seems like you, know, you can put the shunt um, here. Can you see my, the pointer here? Oh, yeah, okay. So uh, you, can put, you can choose to put, when you put in a new shunt, you have a choice of putting it closer to the front of the head or to the back. And um, it, it's truly a matter of personal preference. There are some situations where there is actually a medical reason why it might need to be one or the other. But for the vast majority of cases, it, it is really just a, a surgeon preference. Um, and, and I know about, you know, it's sort of split 50-50 in terms of how people choose to do this for no good reason. And, and we never thought much about it. You know, it, the shunt goes in where it goes in and it shouldn't make a difference. But um, this is when we started to thought, well, does it doesn't make a difference? You know, it may, maybe there is a, a difference between these two. And so Dr. Uh, Bill Whitehead, who's a colleague of mine who, who trained um, at SickKids uh, about 15 years ago and now is at Texas Children's Hospital, he had the idea, well, d maybe this does make a difference. Uh, something seemingly simple that we never really thought, put too much thought in, maybe there's uh, one of these is better than the other. And uh, so how did he start to investigate that? So the way we go about investigating sort of a, a, a new idea that really hasn't gained much traction before is before investing too much time, effort, resources, and money into doing a new study, um, are, is there existing data and old studies out there that we could relook at to answer this question? And so that, that's, what, that's what he did. And so we looked back at a number of old studies that have been published over a 17-year period that had the type of data available there that we could try to look at this question and re-examine data that was already in existence without having to um, put new uh, efforts into it. And so this is what he found. So this is um, a, a graph that um, is a very common type of graph that we see in, in medicine, and it's called a survival curve. And here, again, survival is not life or death, but um, how, how long the shunt survives, how long it goes without needing surgery. And uh, time is on this or horizontal axis here as we move along. You're getting further and further out from the day that the shunt was inserted. And on the uh, vertical axis is uh, what percentage of the shunts still have not needed surgery, that, are, that have survived, as it were. 
And so a perfect shunt would be, uh, would be represented by a line that just starts here at, at 100% and just stays flat right across. It's a shunt that never fails. Um, a, a disaster shunt, the, the, a perfectly bad shunt, is one that as soon as you put it in, fails right away and so it'll be a straight vertical line. Uh, but most shunt survival curves look like what you see here, where they sort of curve slowly down uh, over time. And that means that at any given point in time, there's a risk that the shunt may stop working and fail. And this goes out several years from when the shunt went in. And so this is comparing shunts from, from this old data. This is comparing shunts that went in through a more frontal approach, anterior, versus those that went posterior. And so anything that's higher up on the curve is better. That means at any given point in time here, uh, let's say at 500 days, uh, there's a greater proportion of the shunts that were put in in the front that are doing better than, uh, that, that are still, haven't been operated on than those that have been put in the back. So this is interesting. Now, this, this, what we know in medicine, though, is that when you just do this one type of study with a very specific question looking at old data, it's not the definitive answer because you can just see something like this by chance. Okay? It could be a complete fluke and it may not be the real answer to it. So the next step was to then look at more prospective data. So we, we have this old data. It gives us some interesting ideas. Now, can we validate it? Can we confirm it in, an, in a new data set? And so this is where we looked at prospective data that we'd collected across North America. And you'll see something interesting, that now you see these same two types of survival curves. The shapes are sort of similar, um, but now you don't see that difference between the anterior and posterior. That separation that I showed you before that looks so convincing and, and suggested that the anterior placement was clearly better than the posterior, now you look at it and it, they, they almost overlap. There really isn't much of a difference. And this is what you see in research. And so part of this lesson goes back to uh, what Mark was saying. You can, find any, you can find a study that shows you anything, um, but how often can it be replicated and validated? And so if we had stopped here, you know, that we would have said, well, that's the answer. We're done. Now we're going to put all our shunts in through the front, and, and it's clearly better. But we realize the answer is not that simple. And um, so this is now the next step of it, where it's, it, it gives us a bit of pause. And so now we're at the more definitive stage of this, which is where a lot of the money's going in. This is where it gets expensive. So what, what I, this one slide here summarizes a, a $2 million study, um, where it's, it's a randomized trial, which means that um, the, the, the people who participate in this, when the surgeon goes to put in the shunt, it's basically a computer-generated 50-50 chance of whether we put it in the front or the back because we've established that we're, we don't really have a strong preference and there isn't a clear medical reason to believe one is better than the other. And so we, we, um, it's now a matter of chance. And then what we're gonna do is ultimately when all the patients have been recruited in this study, which will be about 400 patients hopefully by early 2019, um, then look to see uh, which of these is better, if either. My feeling is that we're gonna we see a curve like we, I showed you in this, the second one, which is that there's really not much difference to them, but we'll, we'll, this will be the definitive study that will give us the answer um, to this. So that just gives you a picture about how things are done and how not to be carried away with one interesting uh, result because it, it needs to be uh, replicated, which is why we're so cautious in medicine that just because some study comes out and you see it in the Toronto Star, why aren't, why aren't we all rushing to do this new surgery or new something else? And it's for reasons like this. Um, Okay, and the next problem is the long-term outcome of infants with hydrocephalus and whether endoscopic treatment is uh, better, the same, or worse than, than shunt treatment. And this is, presents a different type of problem. And the lessons to take away from this is, there's a few different lessons. So one is um, pay attention to here to how we're using a rare condition to study a common problem and some of the benefits and the difficulties of trying to use a rare condition as, as a, a means of studying something. And then the difficulties in conducting a randomized trial. So I, I just told you before about a randomized trial that we're doing that's going on quite well, but this is another randomized trial that, that didn't go so well. It was a lot harder to do, and, and we'll talk about that. So the, um, this was a, um, a, a prospective study of infants with um, a condition called aqueductal stenosis to compare long-term outcomes after receiving either endoscopic third ventriculostomy or shunt. And so shunts, this is what a, a shunt looks like. Uh, if you haven't seen it, we, we've talked a fair bit about that. And endoscopic third ventriculostomy is trying to use a, a, an endoscope to uh, create a, a, a hole in, in this bottom part of the brain here where I put the arrow um, to pour, form an internal diversion so that you don't need a shunt. And in, in, this is the scenario where we, you know, we see a baby who has hydrocephalus and needs treatment 
and we impart some type of treatment, either of these two, um, and, and we can measure outcome early on, but often that those early outcomes are measured in terms of the types of graphs that I showed you before, how the shunt is doing or how the ETV is doing. Did we need to do repeat surgery? Did they have a complication? Um, but the, the outcomes that we uh, care more about really are, are how the child's doing when they're five years old or 10 years old or beyond. And um, that's what this is asking. You know, we, we do the surgery when they're six months old, three weeks old. Um, and then we have to wait a long time to figure out what that child's gonna look like when they're hitting grade one or, or grade 10. And we were trying to answer that with this. And we chose to study this in, in children, in infants with aqueductal stenosis, which is actually a, a relatively rare condition. And anytime you do a study, um, you don't want to be studying a rare condition because uh, the way we get robust data is by having lots of data. And if you have a, a condition and you're only going to uh, study a particular subgroup of patients who are quite hard to come by, you're not going to have a lot of numbers. Okay? And I'm, I'm telling you just exactly how we think. This, this is the bare bones way we think. We think in numbers, statistics, and that this is how research questions get answered. So why do we choose this, this rare condition to treat? The reason we chose it is because um, it is th this condition is, is sort of the prototypical pure hydrocephalus condition, meaning these are children who present with hydrocephalus without having had major bleeds in the brain or infections or um, tumors that needed major surgery. So they didn't have other things that could also affect how their brain's functioning. This, this was sort of an isolated pure hydrocephalus that would isolate the effects of the hydrocephalus and also allow us then to isolate the effects of our treatment good or bad. Um, and so that's why we chose this. And so this, these were, we looked at infants who were um, very young, um, under 24 months of age with this condition, pure aqueductal stenosis, and nothing else major going on in the brain by MRI. And, they were not, and these were children, again, who were not born premature because we wanted to eliminate having that other extra uh, factors in there. And a lot of exclusion criteria all these things that could potentially um, add to how the child might be doing that we wanted to not put in the picture uh, for this particular research study. And this is how we had envisioned the study um, happening, that we would have um, eligible patients and then we'd have a discussion with the, uh, between the surgeon and the family to decide on the treatment. And um, we would envision that most patients would go in the randomized arm, meaning that um, we, would, we would say, and, and, and very truthfully, that we didn't know which of these treatments was better and um, so that the, uh, what it would be is that we would be randomized and again, the same computer algorithm, 50-50 chance of then being assigned to either one of these two treatments. We anticipated that would be a hard sell because uh, I think parents would want some control over that decision making even if there was not good evidence that one was better than the other. And that's in fact what happened and so we had very few families agree to the, the randomized arm of this and uh, a lot more who went into the uh, parental preference arm. So we recognized this was going to be a, a possibility. It was more a possibility than we, we um, anticipated. So we did allow for patients to still be in the study if they chose not to go in the randomized arm. And, and that actually saved the study because we were able to follow these children uh, for five years, um, even if they didn't get randomized. And uh, our, our outcome, the big difference in this study compared to most studies, is that we were, even though we were treating these babies as, as babies uh, under two years of age, our primary outcome was, was how they were going to do when they were five. Um, I'll skip over some of this. So we, we looked at a number of different developmental tests uh, to follow these children. Uh, so quality of life questionnaire and another um, outcome measure. Um, and ultimately, because we had so few pa patients in the randomized arm, we, we pulled everybody together and, and looked at them at, uh, at five years of age. And here's one of the problems, the other problem of studying uh, a rare condition. It, it took a long time to do this study. Nine years um, of recruitment, 2004 to 2013, just to recruit the patients that we had. And, and in fact, we had in originally intended to recruit about 200 and we stopped early because recruitment was going so slow at this stage. And, but we still had a good number of, of individuals in the study, 158 of whom 78 were available for the five-year follow-up. Another problem with doing this type of study is not only does it take a long time to um, uh, accumulate enough patients for you to, to say something meaningful, but you then have to follow them for a long period of time. Uh, the challenge of this condition where you treat them at, at a given point in time, but then you have to wait many, many years to uh, look at the five-year outcome. And so we had just about half the patients available for that. One of the things that I, I am proud of, though, with this study is that it was really an international 
uh, study. So this, we had centers, 27 centers um, uh, who recruited patients in Europe, UK, North America, Middle East, South America, and Asia. So this was really a true international study. And this is a, a typical flow diagram of how studies look in, in, in most journals. And you can see here that we had very few patients in the shunt arm compared to the uh, ETV arm. And that was a matter of parental preference. So the vast majority of uh, families um, elected to be in the, in, to have their choice of the treatment. And of those, a majority uh, chose to have ETV, even though, as I said, we did not have good um, um, uh, proof at all that it was a better treatment. Um, this is some of the baseline data. I, I won't go into any detail here, but as we looked at the two groups, there really weren't significant differences uh, between the ETV uh, group versus the shunt group in terms of any of the, the factors at baseline. And this is what the uh, survival curve, so I, I already uh, gave you an idea of what survival curves look like. This is, again, um, uh, how, how well these procedures do uh, in terms of needing repeat surgery. And what you see is um, not all that surprising that for infants, at least, the shunt seems to do a little bit better than, than ETV in terms of needing repeat surgery early on. Um, but this was actually um, sort of, we had two different groups here. So this was all the patients. Remember, they were all under two years of age. But if we split them up into those who were less than six months, it was, that's where all the difference was, that the really young infants did quite a bit better with, uh, with shunt than ETV, at least in terms of needing first uh, another operation. But for those who were over six months, it, there really was no difference between these two, so they overlapped. Um, and uh, here what we see is this, is, this is the meat of the study. This was the five-year outcome on this group of patients. And essentially what we found is that there was really no difference between these two groups of patients. So the, what we're comparing is the, the uh, numbers up here between the, the right and the left. And, and these are what we call the p-values, which tell us if they're statistically different or not. And um, uh, the, the long and short of it is that we didn't find that there was a difference. Not only that, though, for this particular group of patients, one of the heartening things was these numbers, so having a health utility score in, the, in sort of the 0.9 range, that puts you basically at what the general population is like for five-year-old kids. So uh, this particular group of, of children with hydrocephalus, with treatment, they were doing really well. Um, and, and there wasn't much of a difference between the uh, either treatment option. So uh, that gave us um, some degree of comfort. We had, you know, when we looked at this score here, the cognitive score, there, there was a suggestion maybe that there was a, uh, a bit of a difference between the, the shunt and the ETV, but it was not um, uh, significantly meaningful. So we didn't really know how to interpret that. And this is where if we had larger numbers, we might have been able to say something more meaningful. Uh, and just to show you, just to uh, further verify this, these are the, the one to three year results, again, showing no difference. The, the big picture of this is this was, this was 15 years in the making. Um, but that's how long it took to do this large prospective international study. And, and what it confirmed is what we kind of suspected at the beginning, that uh, the decision that we made at the, at the early part of this didn't necessarily make a big difference at, at five years. It's not to say that for any individual child that there, there isn't one procedure that's better than the other. Well, and, but this is how research happens. We, we look at, we, we um, have to um, average things and look at groups of patients. And we, we try to hone the groups down to as, as meaningful a group as possible so that we can take those results and apply it to an individual child, but it's not always that easy. But th that, that's, that's how research is, and it's a bit messy. Um, so the overall conclusions from this, I, I would say that progress in hydrocephalus can be slow, but it's, it's incremental as well, meaning that the, um, the, the first study, for example, that I showed you, looking at the difference between the front versus back shunt, um, I think at most what we're going to find is maybe a 5% difference in, in outcome. It may be the same, but I think at most we might find a 5% difference. That may not sound like a lot, but I think if you add that to other things that we do, then, then o over time, that survival curve that I showed you for um, shunt will slowly get better and better and higher and higher. And um, a as we accumulate these, these small incremental advances, I think they, they cumulatively do add up. Um, and then the, the, the bigger point is that good study questions and, and good study designs are possible, um, but they do take time. But over, over time, I think they eventually move us closer to uh, better outcomes. And I'll stop there. Thank you. I just wonder, uh, do you have any thoughts or uh, data on longer term outcomes for two types of treatment, let's say 10, 15, 20? We do not, so it's not, it, to, to nuance it, it's not as good quality as this, meaning that um, we, 
the, the type of data that you're, that you're referring to we have for uh, kids 15 years out, but it's sort of a, what we call a cross-sectional study, mm -hmm. meaning that we've looked at how these kids are doing at 15 years, but we haven't, we didn't get a lot of good data on them early on, so from when they were treated 15 years ago. Um, and the, 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 the short answer to, to that is that when we, when we have done that type of cross-sectional study at around 15 years, the differences were similar to what we saw here, which is really not statistically different between the two. Did you find that um, when parents were preferring to um, do one procedure over the other, was, was there a difference in like the, the severity of their child's hydrocephalus? Like, did you find that the ones with more severe hydrocephalus chose one over the other? Right. So that's a concern when you have a non-randomized study. So the, 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 the value in the randomization is that it's not a, a parental choice or it's not a surgeon choice. So whatever biases we have that might force you or, or, or guide you towards one versus the other is eliminated. So your question is a very good one, and, and so how we try to deal with studies that are not randomized is um, to then look at um, measures of hydrocephalus severity or other factors at baseline and see whether their ventricle size is different, were they uh, younger, were they sicker in other ways. And so whatever measures we have of that, which we were able to collect because it was a prospective study, they were similar actually between the two.